First, uh, of course, it's important to define what yoga is, and that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Secondly, part two is, um, as I discussed earlier in the preview, uh, Patanjali really approaches yoga from the standpoint of a doctor, from a medicinal standpoint. And the first thing is to diagnose what's wrong. Is there an illness? Not necessarily physical, although it can manifest physically, but what is the illness inside? And this illness, of course, is suffering defined as the, in the seeming inability to be free of the turmoil of the anxious mind. And we'll look at that in just a minute with the definition of yoga. So, specifically, as I note here in Roman numeral 2 at the top of your handout, um, the illness or the disease, the source of suffering, is entanglement in something called materiality or nature, prakriti. And this, just to let the cat out of the bag, simply means that my sense of happiness, when I identify it with the world of stuff that I see, touch, taste, hear, smell, and feel, that I interact with out there, and even to some extent this body is part of that, this mind, this emotional self. But when I interact with all of this, which we're driven to do by being alive, and make the mistake of identifying my happiness with triggers for that happiness, meaning to say, with the world of stuff. As if to say, my happiness comes from outside of myself. If that has been a habit for you or I, then we undoubtedly experience suffering. Why? Very simple. And he is simple in many ways. Very simple. Because the world of stuff is not permanent. So, if I invest in anything that is not solid, that is not permanent, and think that I draw my happiness from it or from them, if it's a person, I will inevitably suffer. Why? Because either I will lose that person as an entity that's there before me that I can interact with or they will lose me <laughs> or I will just, something will shift this is a world of impermanence so we'll unpack that more tomorrow but entanglement or I over identifying with the world of stuff, does this make sense? right? and by this definition everyone in the world that is suffering or causing suffering for others which is the same thing sometimes because uh, nobody causes suffering for others unless they're suffering. That's a spiritual law you can test. Uh, inevitably is suffering because they have placed happiness on something not permanent. Period. If it ended there, we'd have a depressing weekend. But thankfully we have the next few Roman numerals. Okay. And the third is... Uh, moving into the discussion of the cure. You know, diagnose the illness, suffering. We've diagnosed its core, uh, a cause. Attachment to the world of impermanence. What is the cure for Patanjali and for actually everyone, even his yogic um, uh, successors in the tradition known as Tantra? They really hone in on this. Um, what is the cure? It is to have experiences of something called yoga, which we're going to unpack in just a bit. Every time you have a taste of yoga or a peak experience in which that inner witness self is allowed to shine forth, this begins to slowly break up the grip of the mind, which is drawn to do one thing and one thing only. The mind is looking for happiness outside of the self. That is its function, its practice, and its curse from the standpoint of this tradition. And we could say, well, that's awfully depressing. I'm screwed because my mind is what I am, right? And that's our big question. Is it all that you are? By just a taste of any sense of introspection, perhaps in your little journaling exercise, we can become aware, one can become aware that no, the, the, the thinking cognitive mind that obsesses about the past and the future constantly, in fact, that's the only place it can go, is the past and future. Uh, sometimes at these peak moments, it's blown out. And this is what the Buddhists call nirvana. Nirvana means the state in which the um, obscuring mind is blown out of the picture, like a candle that's blown out through some kind of peak moment that's happening. And your mind is babbling, but now 
off in a hayfield somewhere instead of right here in the face. We know that there's another level of awareness because we can watch our mind. And in our highest of highs, the mind is suddenly inactive or takes a back seat to what's happening before you. Does this make sense? But, and we all know this. The problem is what we don't know without studying tradi- excuse me, traditions like this is that yoga or that state of high in which the mind is not running the show is available to us all the time. We make the mistake, Patanjali teaches us, of thinking only in certain moments can I have that high. The rest of the week I have to go to work and deal with my family or deal with my life situations. I, what are the chances I'll have some kind of great high today? It's Monday. You know, that kind of thing. How to experience a state of yoga? Uh, here defined very simply as freedom from suffering. This is a Buddhist interpretation he adopts. Um, and then he goes a little bit deeper into the causes of suffering. So at least it's not all bad news up front. He gives us the illness. He talks about um, the state of yoga to give us some hope to actually learn a practice that allows that natural high that is behind all the highs we've ever had to arise spontaneously, and this is the key point, without a trigger, without needing someone or something to come along and spring you. 